Clinical Reasoning 123 is a brand new, short and sweet, sequential series of clinical reasoning case studies that emphasize a unique aspect of how a nurse thinks in the clinical setting. Though each case study stands alone on its own merit and is only two to three pages in length, they can be used to strengthen student learning in both the classroom and the clinical setting. They only take about 15 to 20 minutes to work through each step. So let's get started. Joanne Smith is a 72-year-old woman who has a history of myocardial infarction four years ago and systolic heart failure secondary to ischemic cardiomyopathy with a current ejection fraction of only 15%. She presents to the emergency department for shortness of breath the past three days. Her shortness of breath has progressed from shortness of breath with activity to becoming SOB at rest. The last two nights, she had to sleep in her recliner chair to rest comfortably upright. She is able to speak only in partial sentences and then has to take a breath when talking to the nurse. She has noted increased swelling in her lower legs and has gained six pounds in the last three days. She is being transferred from the ED to the cardiac step down where you are the nurse assigned to her care for her. So let's look at this scenario. What data from the present problem is relevant and must be interpreted as clinically significant by the nurse? If the nurse fails to recognize what is relevant, they will not be thinking like a nurse and using the skill of clinical reasoning. In this scenario, the, the relevance of 15% must be recognized. That is almost only one-fourth of a normal heart function. Secondly, she has had shortness of breath the past three days and has increased and progressed from activity, uh, shortness of breath with activity to shortness of breath at rest. This is a clinical concern in the context of heart failure. Also, the fact that she's had to sleep in her recliner and be upright. What is the significance of that? Well, that's a huge red flag. We call that orthopnea. And therefore, that uh, is, is something that's telling us that she is sliding in the wrong direction. And finally, She's gained six pounds in the last three days. And as we know, that is too much. But again, these are open-ended questions that the students must be able to recognize. With her vital signs, what's relevant here and why? Her temperature is normal, not a problem, but must be noted. Her pulse is 92, but it is irregular. Why is it irregular? Atrial fibrillation is one of the more common dysrhythmias that we see with cardiomyopathies and must be noted by the nurse. Is this prior or is this new? Additionally, her respirations are 26 a minute at rest. That's too fast. Her SATs are 90% on 6 liters. That's too low. And her blood pressure is 162 over 54. That's too high. As we know with heart failure, the higher that systolic blood pressure, the higher the afterload, and the harder the heart has to work, which is going to increase the overall workload of the heart, which is what we want to bring that down. Let's go to our nursing assessment. The nurse collects the following data. General appearance, the patient appears anxious and is restless. Respirations have coarse crackles scattered throughout both lung fields and is labored respiratory effort. The patient is sitting very upright. Cardiac, her rhythm is atrial fibrillation, pale, cool to the touch with her pulses palpable throughout. She has three plus pitting edema in her lower extremities from her knees down and has an S3 gallop irregular heart rate, and no JVD is noted. Neurologically, she's alert and oriented. Her abdomen is soft, non-tender, and is voiding without difficulty, and her skin integrity is intact. As we look at this assessment by the nurse, what's relevant and why? Well, her general appearance, she's anxious and restless. The nurse must determine why. Is it the shortness of breath, or is there underlying anxiety present? Her breath sounds have coarse crackles. The nurse must be able to interpret the physiology of heart failure and recognize that increased hydrostatic pressure from left-sided failure is increasing alveolar pressure, pushing fluid into the alveolar space. And coarse crackles are more concerning than fine crackles. There's simply more fluid in the alveoli. As we look at the patient uh, with her cardiac status, she has atrial fibrillation. Is this new or old? The nurse must determine. 
She's pale, cool to the touch, and has three plus pitting edema in her lower extremities. That's significant and is telling us that she not only has left-sided failure with her crackles, but with that edema, the nurse must be able to recognize that that is also right-sided failure and is a current problem. And so now let's go on to our rhythm strip. Here's our rhythm strip. What is it? Our students must be able to recognize the classic signings of atrial fibrillation. There's no P wave, it's irregular, and a very erratic baseline. One of the most common dysrhythmias that we will see in clinical practice must be correctly interpreted. So now we've collected some data in the ER. We've got our chest x-ray, and the chest x-ray shows bilateral diffuse pulmonary infiltrates consistent with pulmonary edema. That concern that confirms our primary problem of heart failure. Her CBC, her white count is 4.8, hemoglobin is 12.9, her platelets are 228, and her neutrophils are 68%. As we look at what they were previously, where's our trend going, and is there any clinical concerns in this CBC? Overall, even though we want to note the white count, the neutrophils, the hemoglobin, all of those are within normal range and no critical concerns are present. Let's look at our basic metabolic panel. Sodium is 133, potassium is 4.9, glucose 105, calcium 8.8, .8, the creatinine is 2.9. Looking at where it was before at 2.2, what's happening here? Well, looking at this data in its entirety, why would the sodium be low? Well, knowing that 135 to 145 is normal, that 133 could be dilutional, secondary to fluid volume excess. And recognizing that sodium is kind of like the Kool-Aid electrolyte. If you put that right amount of, of Kool-Aid or crystal light in 16 ounces of water, beautiful, tasty. Too little crystal light or too much water in the same amount, it's going to be dilutional. Same thing with sodium. As we look at the other electrolytes here, our potassium is 4.9 within range, but our creatinine is a problem. It was 2.2 prior, now it's 2.9. It's too high and it's trending upwards. This patient is in progressive renal failure and the nurse must recognize that. Finally, our magnesium is 1.9, our INR is 2.5. And that is no more and it must be noted. And also our cardiac labs, our troponin is 0.1, which is, L, which, is, uh, which is within range, and our BNP is 1,855. That lab value is secondary, is our, is our brain natriuretic peptide that is elevated when there's more left ventricular stretch, and therefore, this is clearly showing that the prior was only 155. This patient is obviously, even by her, by her chemistries, and BNP is an exacerbation of heart failure and must be noted by the nurse. So now the nurse must put it all together. Tanner would say we have to interpret this data and make a clinical judgment. What is the primary problem that's present here? Biventricular heart failure, left as well as right. Secondly, we want to ask in this case study, what are going to be the nursing priorities now that we've identified the primary problem? Well, we want to look at uh, how I would look at this as improving our oxygenation and underlying impaired gas exchange. We want to decrease the workload of the heart, and we want to remove excess fluid, and then situate number three, what interventions and outcomes will you expect are going to be part of our plan of care that we're going to want to, in, uh, we're going to want to, we're going to want to implement in this, uh, in this case study. And as so we look at each case of, of, uh, of, of interventions with each of those care planning priorities, they speak for themselves. I'm not going to spend the time on those. But finally, what educational priorities will be needed to develop a teaching plan for this patient and or family? So I want to be thinking about the nurse as an educator and looking at teaching, looking at the need to look at the sodium, looking at heart failure teaching, medications, etc. As we look at this step one, we did this in just a few minutes. In the classroom, this could be done again in about 15 to 20. And what I want you to be empowered with as an educator is that, it's, is that I want to make it simple for you to bring active learning that can transfer to the clinical setting. That's the strength of my case studies, and especially with these shorter case studies of clinical reasoning one, two, and three. It's only available on my website, keithrn.com. I want you to help your students to think more like a nurse. Get clinical reasoning one, two, three today.